Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Beef Cattle Research Council's webinar on mineral supplementation. My name is Tracy Herbert, and I'm the moderator of tonight's webinar. Um, so I'm the extension coordinator for the Beef Cattle Research Council, which means that my job is to share information between researchers, industry experts, and beef producers on science topics and tools that can benefit the industry. So we do extension like that in lots of different ways, uh, including producing written articles, fact sheets, videos, and webinars, like tonight's, just to name a few. And I'm really excited to see how many people all across the country registered for tonight's webinar. 180 people registered from all across Canada. So we've got people on the line from BC all the way through to Nova Scotia. So welcome to each of you. About 70% of you identified yourselves as cattle producers. And the rest are a split between people who work for industry groups or research organizations or agribusiness, government, or media. So this webinar will last for about an hour, but we may go a little bit longer just depending on how many questions you've got for us later on during the question and answer session. So as you know, we are recording this session and we'll make that video available for everyone to watch. So you'll receive a link to that recording from me in your email in a couple of days along with some supplemental materials that um, you can learn uh, even more about mineral supplementation and how to manage your mineral program. So you can watch this webinar again later, but I encourage you to take some notes as tonight as well, which is going to help you remember some more of what you hear. So of course you're able to hear and see tonight's presenters, but we can't hear or see you. So to communicate with us, um, what you need to do is type into the small chat window in the control panel on the side of your screen. If you have a question or comment for me or either of the presenters, that's the place to do it. And feel free to send in questions at any time throughout the webinar, and we'll be happy to answer all the questions near the end of the hour. Okay, so let's get started. So this is what we're going to be covering tonight. First, you'll hear an overview of what we do at the Beef Cattle Research Council, what checkoff dollars pay for, and an explanation of the beef industry science clusters. Then you'll hear from Dr. John McKinnon, who is going to talk about mineral supplementation for about 40 minutes, and we'll break partway through for some audience participation. So we're going to ask you in the audience some multiple choice questions, but I'll explain that when we get there. Then we'll open it up to questions from you. And finish the webinar by letting you know where to find more information on mineral supplementation and other valuable information that you're probably interested in um, and that you can use right on your farm and ranch. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce the first speaker this evening, Dr. Reynold Bergen. Reynold is the Science Director at the Beef Cattle Research Council, and he's actually kind of hard to introduce because he's involved in so many different things and so knowledgeable on the kind of spectrum of science related to beef production. He's involved in evaluating research proposals, reviewing and communicating about completed research and those results. Uh, he works really closely with other industry groups and government leaders and the media and is continually looking for practical and innovative ways to advance our industry and get the most out of our research investments. So if you subscribe to the Canadian Cattlemen magazine, then you're seeing a bit of what he does there through the research column that he writes in each and every issue. So please welcome Reynolds. All right, here I am. How's that look, Tracy? Can you see yep. everything? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. All right. Um, these webinars that uh, that you're watching are they're put together by the the Beef Cattle Research Council, and uh, the Beef Cattle Research Council. Our mandate is to fund research that'll that'll contribute to the competitiveness and sustainability of Canada's beef cattle industry. Um, we've been around as an organization since the late 1990s. We're funded through a portion of the national checkoff, and each provincial beef group is responsible for deciding how the national checkoff that's collected in their province gets allocated to the BCRC or towards Canada Beef Inc. for marketing. So the dollars that come to us are used for research, and, and we use those dollars to, to essentially uh, leverage other dollars out of government funds and pile all these dollars together to fund research. Um, all of the funding decisions about what kind of things that 
the BCRC funds are made by by producers, and those producers are appointed by the provincial beef groups themselves. So across the country, uh, the, the amount of dollars that go to the BCRC vary from province to province. Um, Saskatchewan contributes 30 cents out of every dollar um, towards the BCRC. That's why Saskatchewan's um, red bar is the tallest. Alberta contributes 20 cents of the national checkoff dollar to research. BC and Nova Scotia are at 10 cents. Manitoba's at 7, and, and Ontario's contributing 2.5 cents. Now, the number of total dollars that each province uh, submits to, to research determines on how much representation they get. So these are the producers who are represented on BCRC right now. And uh, so if I, I'll introduce you to them, going f uh, from the top, from left to right, we've got Dave Zender, who's representing BC. Uh, next to him is Darren Bevins, who's representing Alberta, as is Brian Thiessen, Dr. Brian Edge, and Larry Delver. Those are Alberta's reps to BCRC. On the bottom row, we've got, on the left-hand side, Tim Alexen, who's the chair of BCRC, uh, Ryan Beyerback, and Ken Demian also represents Saskatchewan. Uh, Manitoba is represented by Karen Clark. Ontario is represented by Matt Bowman, who's the vice chair, and Atlantic Canada is represented by John Tilley. Now, BCRC also has some staff um, that, that help support the BCRC uh, and, and provide um, some guidance to the, to the council members and, and recommendations around funding and that sort of thing. Andrea is the executive director. She's an economist by training. She's the brains behind this operation. She moves the chess pieces around. And uh, if she's tuned in tonight, we can all rest assured that she's silently judging us as we speak. This is me. Uh, you can't see my lips move because I'm a ventriloquist. I'm the science director. I try to explain research to producers. I try to explain industry to, to researchers. Um, Tracy Herbert, who introduced this whole thing, is our beef extension coordinator. She is the one who nearly single-handedly put together and runs the beefresearch.ca website and all of the other tech transfer initiatives uh, that we've got underway, communication stuff, and she's responsible for making the rest of us make sense. And Dr. Jock Buchanan-Smith has been with the BCRC right from the start, and he still works with us from time to time. He's a retired prof from the University of Guelph. He's highly respected and gives us a lot of uh, wisdom and guidance in terms of um, assessing research and research proposals and communication. Now, I want to run through the checkoff thing. Some of you who've watched these before hopefully have heard this before, but it's new to a lot of people. It's, it's not a new concept, but it's a little bit complicated, so I'm, I like to run through it every time. Um, producers, when you're selling cattle in Canada, you're paying two checkoffs. You're paying a provincial checkoff, and what that checkoff pays is, you know, it's a dollar in some provinces, it's up to three in some, a lot of provinces it's two. Uh, most provinces, that's refundable. But what that uh, provincial checkoff does is it funds pro provincial activities, like provincial lobbying efforts and policy development and provincial research activities and marketing and promotion things, that sort of thing. It also, the provincial checkoff also funds the Canadian Cattlemen's Association. So those are, are activities like national or international lobbying or trade activities or legal things or policy development, that kind of stuff. So, you know, historically our battles with RCAF, those were funded through provincial checkoff assessments that went to the CCA. The, the, the COOL litigation is funded through the provincial checkoff going to the CCA. Um, Canada's input into the CETA agreements, TPP, um, BICS, um, Code of Practice Development, that's all funded through your provincial checkoff and the provincial assessment to CCA. The other dollar is the national checkoff. That's non-refundable, and that funds two things. It'll fund Canada Beef, Inc. for March marketing and promotion of, of Canadian beef, and it'll also fund us to fund research. That national checkoff doesn't fund the CCA. That gets funded through provincial checkoffs. Now, the dollars that come to the BCRC, if you add them all up, it's about a million dollars a year. 
um, which is a lot of money, but but research is expensive, and that that million dollars really doesn't go all that far um, funding science. So, what we do is we try to use those dollars to leverage uh, in, in other government dollars, and primarily we've been doing that through something called the Beef Science Cluster, which is a lot of money from Agriculture Canada and a lot of money from the national checkoff through us, but there's other funders involved in this as well. Alberta Beef Producers is putting money into this over and above the national checkoff. So is Manitoba Beef. Beef Farmers of Ontario is putting money into this. So is Alberta Cattle Feeders. So is the Quebec Beef Producers Federation, the Grey Wooded Forage Association, Pioneer Grain. We've got additional government funds from Saskatchewan and Alberta. So, so this builds a lot bigger pool of research funds to, to support national activities. Um, oh, what else was I going to say here? Um, one of our more research, or, or sorry, our more recent activities has been the development of, of tech transfer initiatives through beefresearch.ca, our, our website. That website will give you information on everything that we're funding, everything that we ever have funded um, since this organization began in the late 90s. Um, we got fact sheets on everything we've ever supported. Um, and a lot of times these fact sheets do a really good job of, of summarizing an individual project, but but those individual projects are, are really just small pieces of a, of a bigger puzzle. And so what webinars like this do is, is give you as, as producers an opportunity to, to hear from a speaker who can put all those different pieces into a big puzzle so you can get the big picture. And uh, tonight, you know, John McKinnon is, is our presenter tonight, and he's as good as anyone and, and better than most at, at giving a, a good summary of, of big picture issues like mineral supplementation. Um, John is the Saskatchewan Beef Industry Chair at the University of Saskatchewan. He's an excellent researcher, he's an excellent teacher, he's an excellent communicator, and he's really highly appreciated by the scientific community, by students, and, and by industry. So we're really, really happy to have him here tonight. So back to you, Tracy. Great. Thanks very much, Reynold. So if anyone has any questions for Reynold, um, just go ahead and type them in that box anytime and he'll be happy to answer them uh, near the end of the hour. So yeah, so with that I have the pleasure of introducing John McKinnon who um, Reynolds already done a great job of explaining who John is to you. So he's a professor and researcher focused on how cattle's nutrition and environment influence their productivity and carcass quality. Um, and you maybe have already seen him speak at some producer meetings and conferences and so you know that you're in for a good presentation. He also writes a monthly nutrition column in Canadian uh, Cattlemen's Magazine, so you may have read his articles there too, along with Reynolds. So with that, take it away, John. I'll just switch it over to you. Okay, well, thank you, Tracy. I think uh, everything sounds all right on your end? Yep, sounds good. Okay, sounds good. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation as, uh, uh, as well as um, the, uh, the introduction. Uh, certainly a pleasure to speak to the Beef Cattle Research Council community uh, through this webinar. Uh, the title of my presentation is Mineral Feeding is a Year-Round Program. And what I would really like to focus on is some of the questions producers face when choosing uh, a mineral, uh, determining what mineral is right for them in the, in the situation that they find themselves in, and then conclude with uh, uh, some comments on managing the mineral program. So when, when we start to look at uh, deciding what mineral program is, is right for a given production situation, I think there's several questions that, that's important to, uh, to address uh, before one ever starts thinking about purchasing a mineral. Uh, there's certainly lots of choices out there. There's one-to-one -one minerals, two-to-one minerals. Uh, you've seen them all. There's blocks, tubs, boluses, uh, screening pellets, etc., protein supplements. So there's lots of choices. Uh, they all have their own unique formulations, different concentrations of different minerals. So, for example, calcium and phosphorus might vary depending upon the, the formulation, may or may not have high levels of magnesium, uh, protein may be included in some and not others, uh, again, variation in the trace minerals. 
the bioavailability of those trace minerals can vary. So lots of choices and uh, lots of factors that you have to start to build into the decision in choosing what program is right for you. I think probably one of the most important uh, concepts that you have to realize when you're deciding what mineral program is right for you is you really have to think about your own operation, uh, what part of the country you're living in, uh, how that location will actually influence the mineral requirements of your cow herd. So for example, uh, soil types, are you in a gray wooded soil zone that might be selenium deficient, uh, black soil zone, dark brown soil zone, etc. Uh, depending upon where you are, depending on the characteristics, you could be dealing with different soil mineral concentrations such as molybdenum content, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but uh, uh, molybdenum in the soil can have a very negative influence on for each uh, trace mineral availability. Similarly, sulfate levels in the water. Do you, know, do you know the quality characteristics of your water source? Do you know your sulfate levels? Uh, have you had your water tested? Uh, what about your forage in terms of mineral levels? Have you uh, just been testing for the macro minerals or have you been testing for trace minerals? Uh, how often do you do it? How well have you characterized your, your forages in terms of their mineral content? So these are, these are very important questions that will relate back to which mineral program is right for you. And again, we'll talk a little bit about that as we get into the uh, webinar. Finally, it's also very important to recognize when you're choosing a mineral that mineral requirements aren't static. Uh, they're going to change with the reproductive calendar of your cow herd. Uh, they change with stage of pregnancy. They change with uh, lactation and breeding requirements. And we have to remember, both from mineral nutrition point of view, but as general nutrition principles as well, that there's really two critical periods. That time period from 60 days or so pre-calving, basically the, the last trimester of pregnancy, right through the breeding season. These are two critical periods that will really influence uh, the reproductive success of your cow herd. Uh, and they're critical from a mineral point of view. Uh, and we have to pay attention to the, to the requirements in, in these periods. As well, we have to think about uh, requirements over the course of the summer, uh, extended grazing into the fall, and winter feeding. So again, coming back to that concept of a year-round winter feeding program. So let's look at some of the macro minerals first, and we'll look at loose mineral programs as an example. And typically, these are built around calcium and phosphorus. They're really designed to match the, the forage type. Uh, they uh, will vary in the concentration of calcium and phosphorus. Uh, often we see with some of the uh, companies today, they're actually designing mineral programs that, that will change or, or target different aspects of the reproductive calendar of the cow herd. So as you approach calving, or as you get into the uh, breeding season, they, they will increase the concentration of magnesium, for example. Uh, so they will vary depending upon uh, stage of, uh, of production of the cow. They may or may not supply salt. Uh, and again, they're going to be really designed to match animal requirements, and they're going to be designed to match forage quality. So if we look at calcium, for example, and, and the example I'm going to use throughout the presentation is a 600 kilogram cow, so roughly 1,300 pounds and eating 2% of her body weight. So that's 12 kilograms of dry matter she's consuming. And if we look at uh, calcium requirements uh, through the second trimester, third trimester, and post-calving, you can see they go from about 20 grams a day. And just to put it in context, uh, 28 grams is an ounce. So we're about two-thirds of an ounce in the second trimester. We're about an ounce or 32 grams in uh, the third trimester. And then depending upon the level of uh, 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 how much that cow is milking, we can get up to 40 grams or more calcium required uh, post-calving. So uh, you can see how those needs change uh, as that cow moves through uh, the latter stages of gestation and into lactation. Phosphorus really follows the same trends, uh, roughly half the requirements of, uh, of what's needed for calcium, 
but also know that they tend to, to, to increase as we go from second to third to uh, post-calving and into lactation. So when we look at uh, calcium and phosphorus uh, requirements, we also often try to match them with the calcium and phosphorus content of, of the feeds that we're dealing with. And this, these are, are generalizations uh, that generally hold true, uh, don't um, uh, substitute for a feed test. But if, if we look at legumes and if we look at grass legume forages, generally they're going to be high in calcium, anywhere from 1 to 2 percent calcium, and relatively low in phosphorus, somewhere around 0.1 to 0.2 to 0.3 uh, percent phosphorus. So uh, if we look at this uh, in terms of requirements, more than likely we're going to need to uh, supplement phosphorus, uh, but we won't really need to uh, supplement calcium. So we'll be looking for a mineral that's relatively high in phosphorus. That might be a one-to-one -one mineral. Uh, in some cases, uh, for example, some dairies might use a one-to-two mineral. Uh, to, to bring in that phosphorus. If we start looking at uh, grass-type forages, so brome hay, for example, they tend to be uh, intermediate in calcium, somewhere around 0.4 to 0.5 percent uh, calcium, and again, relatively low in phosphorus. If we look at uh, cereal green feeds, uh, so if we look at oats grown for green feed, or barley grown for green feed, or barley silages, uh, corn silage even, uh, a lot of these types of uh, cereal green feed and silages are going to be intermediate in both calcium and phosphorus, uh, a bit on the low end of phosphorus. So generally, we're going to be looking at bringing in a phosphorus-based mineral, and just depending upon the combination that we're dealing with, uh, with these other forages, uh, we might be dealing with a two-to-one mineral or a one-to-one -one mineral in terms of calcium and phosphorus. If we're looking at backgrounding cattle or finishing cattle and we're starting to feed relatively high levels of cereal grains, we have the opposite problem. We've got uh, intermediate levels of phosphorus now, somewhere around 0.3 to 0.4 percent, and uh, very low levels of calcium. So in almost all cases, uh, uh, growing rations as well as uh, finishing rations require some degree of calcium supplementation. Uh, whether it's through a loose mineral program or perhaps through limestone. If we look at magnesium and potassium, there are two other macro minerals that are required. They're both essential in their own right. Uh, the magnesium requirement for a lactating beef cow is 0.2% uh, of the diet dry matter. Uh, the potassium requirement is somewhere around 0.5 to 0.7% uh, of the diet dry matter. Now, if we look at potassium, it's rarely an issue in Canada. I, I don't think I've ever seen an issue with potassium deficiency. In fact, uh, potassium tends to give us more grief due to high levels uh, than uh, deficiency situations. So high levels of potassium in forages, particularly early spring growth, particularly that's been fertilized with um, um, uh, uh, manure, the uh, potassium uh, uh, can actually start to tie up other minerals and in particularly tie up um, uh, magnesium. Uh, magnesium deficiency by itself is relatively rare, uh, but when we start dealing with cases where we see high potassium, uh, we get into issues where uh, pre-calving, uh, we can almost see uh, what's called a winter tetany or, or a staggers type condition uh, that's precipitated by these high potassium levels. So when we look at these loose mineral programs, they're going to be built around calcium and phosphorus. Uh, they'll supply trace minerals as well that are going to vary in concentration and availability. They'll supply vitamins, A, D, and E generally. Uh, they're going to vary in their susceptibility to, to weathering, and there's some new technology uh, out there, sort of anti-weathering technology. Uh, they'll vary in palatability, uh, and they're going to vary in price. So again, there's decisions that, that we have to make. Uh, and we'll come to some of those decisions in a few minutes, but let's first look at trace minerals. The trace minerals that we're concerned about is zinc, copper, iodine, cobalt, iron, selenium, and magnesium. And again, depending upon where you are in the country, 
Uh, issues with trace mineral deficiency are going to vary depending upon uh, conditions that are inherent to your uh, local operation. I don't have time to talk uh, about all of these, but I'll just focus on copper, iodine, and, and uh, pardon me, uh, I'll co focus on zinc, copper, and selenium. So when we look at requirements for trace minerals, uh, as opposed to the macro minerals where they're expressed as a percent of the diet dry matter, trace minerals are expressed as milligrams per kilogram of diet dry matter, or if you look on the mineral tag, parts per million. So PPM is equivalent to milligrams per kilogram of diet dry matter. So in the case of copper, the, the uh, recommendation for the requirement uh, put out by the NRC is 10 milligrams of copper per kilogram of diet dry matter. For zinc, it is 30 milligrams per kilogram of diet dry matter. And you can see for selenium, it is uh, all the way down to 0.1. So very, very small amounts. The, literally the, the needle in the haystack situation, uh, 0.1 milligram per kilogram of diet dry matter is what's uh, required. Very low levels, but if we're not supplying the adequate amounts, we can get into some fairly uh, uh, significant situations. So I, I jumped ahead of myself just a little bit, so I'm just going to back up here. Uh, if we look at that 600 kilogram cow, uh, she's consuming 2% of her body weight, so that's 12 kilograms of dry matter. Uh, if we calculate out those requirements, at 12 kilograms of dry matter times the 10 parts per million, or 10 milligrams per kilogram, the requirement of that animal is going to be 120 milligrams for copper. The same calculation for zinc is 360 milligrams. And the same uh, 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 calculation for selenium is only 1.2 milligrams of selenium. So these are the daily requirements for each of these three uh, trace minerals to be supplied to the animal uh, that then will provide, when, when take into account uh, uh, availability uh, from, from feed and mineral sources, will supply the animal with the actual absorbable amount of these trace minerals that are required. So let's keep these numbers in mind as we go through this uh, a little bit later on. So now coming back to the fact that these trace minerals require in very small amounts, but if they're in a deficient situation, you can see we can get into some very serious situations, both with our calves as well as uh, with the breeding herd. So we can see with zinc deficiency, reduced growth, feed intake, and feed efficiency in calves. In growing bulls, we can see reduced testicular growth uh, as well as abnormal sperm production. And if those animals get into the breeding herd, you can well imagine the issues that's going to happen with conception down the road. Skin abnormalities as well as uh, lameness issues due to poor uh, or weak uh, hoof horn growth. If we look at copper uh, characteristics, uh, deficiency uh, symptoms, rough hair coat, depigmentation, de uh, off color to the hair, uh, uh, very characteristic of, of copper deficiency. Leg abnormality, stunted growth, cardiac failure, and probably most insidious of all is the fact that we get into uh, over time af after a copper deficiency is developing, we just start to see poor reproductive performance in the cow herd. Delayed estrus, poor conception rates, uh, depressed estrus, uh, the cows just aren't performing uh, as they should be, and we start to see more open cows. Selenium is perhaps a little bit more uh, uh, obvious in some of the deficiencies. If, if we see them off the bat, and that would be, for example, white muscle disease in calves, poor growth, lameness in, in those that survive, reduced immune response uh, in cows, increased incidence of retained placenta. So, there's no doubt, and, and we could talk a lot about research that's been done in Canada, uh, across the country, about uh, demonstrating uh, trace mineral deficiencies. And, and there's, there's no doubt that they occur, and there's no doubt that, that we need to supplement trace minerals. And so we're going to move on to looking at choosing these programs and looking at trying to understand which minerals best for us. 
But at this point, I think it's, it's a good idea that we'll stop here and uh, we'll uh, start with our pop-up questions that Tracy's going to provide us with. Yep, perfect. So now it's kind of the time for audience participation. We've got three multiple choice questions for you all. Uh, so you'll see them on your screen and I'll read them out and then you can click on your answer and then we'll share the results live with everyone. But your answers here will be anonymous. So here's our first question. Do you test your forages for mineral content? So your options are yes, I routinely have my samples tested occasionally, so just once in a while, but not every year, uh, or no, you don't normally have your forages tested. So go ahead and click on your answer. Again, the people on the webinar can't see what your individual answer is. Um, we'll just be able to see the overall results grouped together. So give you about five or ten more seconds to send in your answer, um, and then we'll be able to see how popular forage testing is. Okay, I can see there's still a couple more votes coming in. Okay, let's see the results. Okay, so 48% of you said that you don't normally test your forages. 27% of you said occasionally. And 25% of you routinely have samples tested. Okay, next question. Do you have your cattle's water source tested for sulfates and other water quality issues? So the options are the same for this question. Either yes, I routinely have water samples tested, occasionally, or no, you don't normally have them tested. So again, five or ten more seconds for you to submit your answer, and then we can see how common it is for producers to uh, send in their water samples of their animals' water sources. Okay, looks like votes are in. So let's see the results. 67% of you said no, you don't normally have your water quality tested. 26% of you said occasionally, and 7% of you do routinely have your water sources tested. Okay, and last question. Have you ever noticed any problems in your herd related to mineral deficiencies? So the options are yes, and they were confirmed by a veterinarian as being caused by mineral deficiency. So examples here might be poor reproductive performance or white muscle disease. Next one is yes, I have seen obvious symptoms that I believe were due to mineral deficiency but wasn't necessarily confirmed. So examples here might be listless cattle or um, seeing a higher incidence of retained placentas. Next one is maybe. My cattle have had poor performance, but I don't know whether it was related to mineral deficiency or another management issue. So for example, maybe you've had lower than expected weight gain or lower than expected conception rates in your herd, but you're not sure what the reason behind that is. And then the last option is no. I don't believe my cattle have shown signs of mineral deficiency. So click on your answer there. Um, and then this one will be especially interesting to see whether you know, you're reporting seeing symptoms in your herd that might be due to mineral deficiencies. Okay, a few more seconds to get your answers in. Okay, let's see the results. So the majority of you, 43% say no, you don't believe that uh, your cattle are showing any signs of mineral deficiency. 31% have you have said maybe, that you've seen poor performance but you're not sure of the cause. 14 have seen obvious symptoms that you believe are due to deficiencies and 12% of you um, have had a veterinarian confirm that problems in your herd were caused by mineral deficiency. So that's it for poll questions. We'll hand it back over to John. Okay, uh, thanks uh, Tracy. Um, so what I'd like to do now is really start to look at the question, uh, what mineral is right for me and what, what 
decisions should I start to think about or, or what decisions do I need to make to, to make that choice and, and hopefully make it intelligently. And part of that is going to be understanding your, your mineral tag. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that. So first I'm going to put up uh, two different mineral sources and uh, I'm going to compare them as we, we go through the next few slides. So just two, brand A, brand, brand B, you can see they're both supplying selenium at the same level uh, in terms of parts per million. If you look at the, the macro min minerals, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, there's really not a whole lot of difference between these two minerals. One's got a little bit more calcium, uh, but that's about it. The sodium it is just uh, an indication of the salt level, and so there's uh, basically twice as much salt in the uh, brand B as there in, is in brand A. But if we look at the uh, trace minerals, so the cobalt, the copper, the zinc, and the magnesium, you can see that brand A is uh, basically half of what, uh, in terms of concentration, as what we see for brand B. And let's, I'll just throw out two prices. I'll put $1,200 a ton on brand A, and I'll put, say, $1,500 a ton on brand B. So obviously a more expensive mineral supplying a greater concentration of these uh, trace minerals. So, you know, the question is, uh, does brand A meet the requirements for my operation? Uh, the opposing question could be, is is it worthwhile spending that extra $300 a ton to, to purchase those extra uh, levels of trace mineral in brand B? So what's, what's the decision I should be making here, and uh, which direction should I go? So, in order to do that, uh, the, the first thing is, again, we've got to take a bit of a step back. And you know, with, with all of our minerals, we, we really have to look at, at the feed that we're providing to, the, to these cattle and really look at the concentration of, uh, of the uh, uh, minerals in the feed. And so as an example, again, if it was calcium, uh, I would want to know, am I dealing with a legume and what level of calcium is in there? And maybe yeah, I don't have to supply uh, a specific calcium-based mineral uh, if I've got a, a fairly high legume-based diet. Uh, again, for lack of time, I'm only going to stick to one mineral to go through this example, uh, but I'll focus on copper. And so here, uh, we're just feeding a mixed hay, uh, and the analysis is 10 parts per million. And again, we're feeding 12 kilograms of it to this cow. And uh, so if we take that uh, 12 kilograms of feed, and times it by the 10 milligrams that uh, are in the feed, we get 120 milligrams that are supplied from uh, the hay. Now, if you remember a couple of slides back, I said that's the requirement for copper, right? So the, the first question that probably comes to our mind is, does this meet the requirement? Uh, the requirement's 120, and there's 120 milligrams in the feed. Uh, on, on the surface, yes, it looks like it meets the requirement. But the one thing that we have to realize about many of these trace minerals in particular uh, is that the availability of these trace minerals in the feed ranges from zero to, to in the case of copper, 5%, depending upon uh, the number of antagonists that can be found in the feed and the water. The availability of trace minerals such as copper, which is very, very poor, but even zinc and manganese, are, are very poor in these feeds. They're tied up in the fibrous structure of the feed, and they're not very available to that animal. So the availability of that 120 milligrams of copper from the hay is virtually zero. Uh, and in a best case scenario, we might have somewhere around six milligrams of that uh, being available if 5% is available. So in essence, we have virtually no copper available in the feed uh, that's available to this animal. So we have to look at some type of mineral to meet this animal's need. So the next step in determining which mineral is, uh, is going to be right for us and to understand the mineral tag is we really have to look at what is the expected consumption of the mineral. And that, again, that will be listed on the tag. And in this case, uh, I just said that brand A, uh, the tag indicates uh, expected consumption is 15 grams per 100 kilograms of body weight. So this 600 kilogram cow, 
uh, should be consuming 90 grams of that mineral a day. Uh, again, uh, one ounce is roughly 28 grams, so we're dealing with three ounces per day is the expected consumption of brand A. Brand B, the mineral tag just simply says 100 grams per day expected mineral consumption. So a little bit more, just over three ounces a day in brand B. So a little bit different in consumption, but really there's, there's not a lot of difference there. So the next step in understanding the mineral tag and understanding what the mineral is supplying the animal in terms of copper is to start to look at the tag and what the copper concentration is on that tag. So again, the first line that I have here um, uh, where my arrow is, that's just the expected consumption. So we're expecting 90 grams of uh, the mineral to be consumed uh, per day. Uh, in terms of kilograms, you divide by 1,000, so that gives us 0.09 of a kilogram of mineral consumption that's expected. Now the tag in this case indicates 1,300 parts per million of copper or 1,300 milligrams for every kilogram that the animal consumes. So the copper intake uh, uh, is basically taking the 0.09 times in it by 1,300 and it comes out to 117 milligrams of copper per day that's supplied uh, by that mineral. Now again, let's put it back in the perspective of the requirement. The requirement is 120. So what we're looking at now is uh, the mineral supplying basically the requirement uh, for copper for that animal. So the question then becomes, is this uh, appropriate? Are we satisfied with uh, this level of supplementation? Okay. And again, we will answer that question uh, uh, in a few slides down the road. Let's look at uh, mineral tag B or brand B. That's the consumption at 100 grams per day or 0.1 of a kilogram. This tag indicates 2,000 parts per million uh, in terms of the concentration. So 0.1 times 2,000 gives us 200 milligrams of copper uh, from this mineral. And again, we're looking at a requirement of 120 milligrams. So we're not quite double, but we're certainly significantly over the requirement uh, with brand B, which again, if we want to draw back to our pricing scenario, we might be dealing with uh, a mineral that's $300 a ton more. So again, the, the question we start turning around in our minds, we have brand A that looks like it's meeting the requirement. It's 300 bucks cheaper. Is that the one I should be going with? Okay. Now we can do the same thing uh, for all the minerals uh, in each of these uh, uh, two sources, brand A and brand B. So what I've simply done is for the macro minerals as well as for the trace minerals, I've calculated out on the left-hand column the amount that's supplied and on the right-hand column the daily requirement. And if you look at the red box that I've uh, drawn just around the three trace minerals, you can see that this brand A is just about at the copper requirement. It's slightly low on zinc and it's slightly low on the manganese. So again, we're dealing with a situation where we're not quite meeting requirements. Uh, perhaps in the zinc and the manganese, we might be getting a little bit more out of the feed than what we would out of copper. So, you know, again, we might be tempted to say, is, is this the right mineral for me at that $1,200 price? Again, looking at brand B, doing the same type of calculations, we're oversupplying copper, we're oversupplying zinc, and we're oversupplying manganese. And again, we have to question, do we need to go to this level of oversupplementation? Well, I wish there was a, a, an easy answer to this, but again, the, the points that I was making at the beginning of this presentation, we have to come down to local situations, local environments, to really understand uh, what the copper requirements are of your cows. And basically, copper requirements are not static. We can't say that copper requirements are 10 parts per million. We could say they vary anywhere from probably 4 parts per million to 15 or maybe even a little bit higher than that. It's a moving target depending upon the level of antagonists or other minerals in the feed and the water that will tie up copper in terms of availability and can 
generate a secondary copper deficiency. And again, we look at the molybdenum content of the feed, sulfur content of feed and water, iron content of feed and water, and zinc. All of these are culprits in terms of tying up co copper. I'll focus primarily on molybdenum and sulfur. If we look at the NRC requirement that uh, certainly a lot of us nutritionists in ways would use as, as kind of a, a Bible for looking at requirements, again, that requirement of 10 parts per million is based on the following assumption, that the molybdenum content of the feed is less than 2 milligrams per kilogram of diet dry matter, and the sulfur content of the feed and the water does not exceed 0.25%. Both of these individually, so molybdenum as well as sulfur, will tie up copper. Furthermore, you can get three-way interactions occurring in the rumen and in the gut where the molybdenum and the sulfur and the copper form complexes that render the copper either uh, not absorbable or if it is absorbed, uh, not available for metabolic purposes. So in essence, renders it unavailable to the animal. So once we start dealing with uh, high situations of molybdenum, uh, we start to get very worried about uh, an indicator, and that's the copper molybdenum ratio. And so really it's the ratio of the copper content of the feed to the molybdenum content of the feed. So if we've got copper at 10 parts per million, and molybdenum at one part per million, we have a 10 to 1 ratio. And that is an ideal situation. And really, molybdenum under those types of situations will not influence copper availability. But as that ratio moves down and gets lowered below 3 to 1, so particularly as it gets to 2 to 1 and lower, we can get into a very drastic situation where copper is virtually unavailable to that animal because of molybdenum. Ideally, that ratio is 5 to 1 or greater. And the same thing with sulfur content of the feed in the water. Uh, a typical sulfur content in feed is going to be around 0.15%. As that starts moving up in combination with water uh, sulfur levels to 0.2 to 0.25 to 0.3, all the way up to 0.45 or greater, progressively copper availability decreases. Okay, And so we've got these antagonistic conditions where if you don't know your situation in terms of molybdenum content of the soil, which will influence uh, the forage levels of molybdenum, your sulfate levels in, in your drinking water uh, for the cows, uh, you really don't know how much copper that you will be needing. Now, if we look at a situation here, so this is my 600 kilogram cow again. She's drinking 12 kilo, or consuming 12 kilograms of dry matter and drinking 45 liters of water a day. So that copper in the feed at 10 parts per million that we've been discussing, that, that really is, is not considered available. We've got a sulfur concentration in the feed at 0.15%, molybdenum concentration at 1 parts per million, water sulfate levels about as low as you'll ever see them we really have an, uh, an ideal situation here where the antagonistic uh, actions of copper and molybdenum are at their lowest level. And uh, if we look at brand A, so uh, where we are dealing with relatively close concentrations of, of copper being met, uh, we very well may be able to develop a mineral feeding program that matches requirements using brand A under these types of conditions. If we go to a situation here, for example, though, where all of a sudden the sulfur concentration in the feed is at 0.35 percent, uh, if molybdenum concentrations are at five parts per million, so our, our ratio now is uh, two to one, uh, sulfate levels at 500 milligrams uh, per liter of water, which is, it's getting up there, but is by no means high. Uh, there's lots of areas, certainly in Western Canada, where we'll see water sulfate levels uh, 1,000 milligrams or, or higher per liter. Uh, here we're dealing with a situation where we've got very antagonistic interactions occurring with both copper and molybdenum that's going to, or pardon me, both sulfur and molybdenum that's going to tie up copper. And if we were looking at brand A, uh, I would suggest to you that that would be an inappropriate mineral 
uh, for this type of situation and that we should be looking at uh, uh, a situation like brand uh, B that is supplying higher levels of these uh, trace minerals that are going to overcome these types of antagonistic situations. And in fact, if there's issues in the herd, we may even need to start blending in or go into minerals that have a blend of chelated minerals just to increase the availability under these types of situations. So again, it's, it's not an easy answer to, uh, to come up with in terms of how much copper do I need and which mineral is most appropriate for my situation. You have to understand your situation and then work with your nutritionist, work with your veterinarian to come up with that appropriate mineral program uh, for your uh, operation. I would like maybe just to, to quickly switch gears and just end with, with a, a few uh, slides on managing a mineral program and some of the questions that, that we get about uh, 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 consumption of minerals and uh, uh, either excessive consumption or, or uh, uh, the opposite situation. So, you know, often you'll hear questions from producers about, you know, I've just put out a new mineral or I've just put out the mineral and you know, these intakes are, are variable, they're all over the place. Uh, the one extreme is they're eating me out of, eating me out of house and home. Uh, they won't stop eating that mineral, you know, they're eating it like candy, right? Uh, uh, the cows just can't seem to get enough of it. To all the way to the other extreme is that the cows just won't eat it, they turn their nose up at it, what's going on here? So, you know, we, we, get, we get this uh, whole range of intake questions uh, that uh, uh, producers ask, and you know, one of the the, the questions that, that that we sort of turn back to producers is, you know, if they're eating it like candy, when was the last time that they had mineral, right? So if they've come off pasture and, and they they haven't had mineral all summer, and and perhaps they haven't had it uh, through the winter, and now you can put it out just prior to calving. Uh, well, it might be a reason why it tastes like candy. They need time to adjust to it. They're, they're going to go after that mineral. Uh, they're going to sort of come to a, a level of homeostasis where, where they're starting to build up stores again. Uh, and they really need that time, whether it's two weeks, three weeks, uh, where you have to let them adjust uh, to that intake before you start trying to make decisions about how to limit mineral intake. Uh, on the other side of things, in terms of palatability, where they won't touch it, uh, there could be issues with uh, too high a level of phosphorus, uh, for example, in the mineral, uh, which uh, can cause a bitter taste to it. Uh, various minerals from various companies will have different flavoring agents. So one mineral might be uh, preferred uh, just due to the flavoring agent that's added. Uh, either lack of salt in the mineral or salt in the mineral. Uh, can influence the palatability of that mineral as well. So there's, there's things that you can look at in terms of uh, why they're not eating that mineral. Uh, in addition to palatability as, aspects of it, uh, are there other sources of uh, salt, for example, that might be available, that they might be going to those sources for salt and therefore not coming to the mineral? Uh, water quality issues, again, could come into play. So now when we start dealing with very high sulfate waters, 1,500 parts per million, 2,000 parts per million, uh, those cattle might not be going to a, a, a mineral mix uh, that contains salt simply because uh, of that high salinity in the water that they're drinking. The location of the mineral feeder obviously is going to have uh, an impact on uh, mineral intake. Uh, you know, we've long recognized that we can manage that mineral feeder and its location to uh, to not only manage the pasture, but to manage uh, mineral consumption. So where is it between uh, feeding areas and the water source? Where is it relative to the salt source? Where is it uh, located in the pasture? Uh, uh, can certainly uh, start to influence uh, the level that these cows are, are uh, accessing mineral from that feeder. Uh, and management of the feeder. So again, if it's uh, exposure to wind, exposure to rain and snow, uh, taking of those those minerals uh, basically where, where they're not really going to get anything out of them anymore, uh, leaching of those minerals uh, can be an issue if that mineral feeder isn't designed right. Today we can see uh, weatherproof minerals, 
uh, in terms of the design of the minerals by these companies that they're really kind of a unique uh, uh, formulation to them that uh, just allows uh, them to shed water and uh, to maintain their uh, integrity. Uh, and again, how often are you checking that mineral? How often are you filling the mineral? Uh, are pretty obvious answers in terms of uh, influencing mineral intake. A couple of issues in, in terms of uh, evaluating the mineral program. Um, again, a lot of the times, uh, uh, I know that a lot of the times that veterinarians get calls from, from their uh, clients, uh, as well as nutritionists from feed companies, it, it's really when the horse is out of the barn that, that the producer is, has, has had issues. And maybe their clinical symptoms, whether it's lameness, milk fever, uh, you know, retained placentas, maybe it's subclinical uh, issues, uh, whether it's open cows, open first calf heifers, uh, just poor doing cattle. Uh, often, you know, the, the, the horse is out of the barn. There, there is an issue before professional help is called in. So I, I don't think you want to wait uh, uh, for that wreck to occur. You want to work with your nutritionist, your feed companies. You want to work with your, your veterinarian to ensure that, that you've got your cows on the right program. Uh, if you do have issues, for example, with open cows, poor conception, uh, don't just focus on the mineral program. There are other reasons for uh, these issues. And again, uh, it could be related to uh, general nutrition, general energy intake in those two critical periods. Uh, you know, if your cows are thin, why are they thin? Uh, health issues, fertility issues. There's lots of issues that you can have uh, uh, reproductive uh, outcomes that, that you're not happy with. Uh, and again, that's why you want to get uh, professional help early on uh, so that you can get a feeding program that targets uh, reproductive success that encompasses the total nutritional management of the cow herd. Uh, you want to monitor mineral intakes, how much is actually being uh, uh, consumed. Uh, we know that there's day-to-day -day variation. We know that there's cow-to-cow -cow variation. Uh, you know, if we're dealing with uh, 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 basically ad-lib, uh, self-feeding type programs, we have to rely on the ability of those cows to, to consume uh, the mineral that's required. Uh, we will see variation over the course of the season in terms of intake. And again, that's due to changes in grass, change, changes in availability of minerals within the grass, the quantity of minerals in the grass, et cetera, uh, and some of the other issues that we've talked about. You also really want to uh, monitor intake. So uh, make sure that if you're, you're putting those bags out that, uh, and if it's in different pastures, record what, what bags are going into what pastures and what cows are in those pastures and really start to get a handle on what those cows are eating. You might think they're eating three uh, ounces per head per day, but in some cases they, they may very well not be. So make sure you monitor intakes. And again, you know, like we've discussed, are you using the right mineral? And it comes down to these characteristics of knowing your operation in terms of forage mineral content, the soil mineral characteristics, the water mineral characteristics, uh, and you know, um, what requirements you have for the situation that you are uh, uh, living under. And finally, if you do have issues, uh, you know, you can confirm those, uh, again, by working with your veterinarian. Uh, he or she can come out, they can take blood samples, they can start to, to uh, look for situations where uh, serum copper, zinc, et cetera, are going to be at deficient levels, and that's going to give them a diagnosis. If you've got open cows that are going for uh, uh, for slaughter, for example, so you're going to ship the open cows uh, and you think you've got a problem, have your veterinarian do a liver biopsy on them and that, that'll be sort of the gold standard in terms of whether or not uh, you're dealing with a deficiency situation. So in summary, uh, mineral deficiencies are real, they exist across the country. Uh, we, if we want productive uh, herds uh, in terms of health uh, and uh, 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 economics, we, we need to make sure we're addressing these deficiencies because they can have uh, very real economic consequences. Uh, I know of far too many producers that have learned the hard way 
from not feeding the right minerals. Uh, a sound mineral feeding program is going to target the needs of the cows as they move through their reproductive calendar, and it's going to vary across the country by these factors that we've talked about. So at that point, Tracy, I think I will stop, and um, we can turn it over to, uh, or turn it back to you. Great. Thank you very much, John. Excellent presentation, as always. Lots of good information and, you know, to help us understand our animals' mineral needs and things that we can think about trying on our own herds to keep our production and our profits up. So, excellent. Thank you. Uh, so, we'll now open it up to questions. Just switching things back over here. So again, type your questions into the chat box on the side of your screen. If your control panel has closed, you should see an orange arrow near the top. So just click on that arrow, it'll expand again, and then you should be able to see the spot where you can type your question in. Um, your questions here are anonymous as well. I'll just read out your question and then we'll hear from Reynolds or John. So we have got a couple questions in already. Uh, okay, the first one's for you, John. The question is, what is the best way to offer supplements to my cattle? Mixed into the ration or free choice? Certainly the, um, uh, the ideal method, uh, if you can do it, is to mix them into the ration. Uh, in essence, that is going to uh, dictate that, you know, uh, in a well-mixed ration, with the appropriate supplement, uh, in essence, every mouthful uh, will provide the appropriate level of supplementation that, that's required. So uh, that is the ideal way to do it. Uh, that's the way we will see it uh, uh, if we're dealing with uh, most backgrounding operations and certainly most finishing operations. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in most cow-calf operations, uh, we're not always feeding uh, a total mixed ration. In some cases, we might be able to provide it through fortified uh, grain screen pellets or uh, other uh, uh, fortified uh, uh, pellets that are being being fed to the animals. But many producers really have to rely on uh, uh, free choice uh, supplementation and uh, loose mineral feeding programs, tubs, blocks, etc. And uh, again, uh, we have to accept the fact that there is going to be variation from day to day, and there's going to be variation between animals. Good. So the next question kind of leads off of that one. Um, how do I ensure that my cows are eating the amount of mineral that they should be daily when I'm uh, offering them free choice? I think that, that comes back uh, a little bit to... Uh, to what, what I was just um, indicating, uh, you know, if we're dealing with free choice supplementation, uh, we do know there is going to be variability uh, day to day and, and between animals. Uh, the day to day variability is is uh, really uh, it, it's it's not a huge issue simply because uh, these minerals are, are are going to be stored within. Uh, the liver of the animal, or they're going to be stored within the skeletal system of the animal. So there is is backup storage uh, in many cases, uh, and so uh, there is a bit of flexibility in terms of short-term uh, uh, variation in terms of intake. Uh, so so um, when we're dealing with free choice feeding programs, really what we want to focus on is is many of the aspects that I talked about under the, the management. Uh, side of things. So uh, we really want to ensure that uh, on a herd basis that uh, we know how much mineral that we're putting out into those mineral feeders. Uh, we know what's being consumed so that we're at least targeting on a herd average the, um, uh, the expected mineral consumption for the mineral that we're feeding and that we've got the right mineral out there for the situations that we're dealing with. And again, that situation is going to vary depending upon the requirements of the cows, the forages that we're feeding, and many of those geographical issues that, that I was talking about in terms of um, you know, antagonistic factors that could come into play. Great. 
Um, next couple questions are also for you, John. So do uh, cattle crave the minerals that they're low in, and will they eat more of the minerals that they need the most? Okay, that's, that's a question that I um, uh, often get, and um, in essence what it's, it's really getting at is uh, do, do cows have nutritional wisdom when it comes to um, uh, identifying that they are deficient in a specific mineral and perhaps uh, can then seek out in its environment uh, or seek out a specific mineral that would address that deficiency, and and you know the the answer to that is is basically no. They they do not have that nutritional wisdom, uh, with maybe two exceptions, and uh, one would be salt, and uh, cattle will certainly crave salt, and they will certainly seek out uh, uh, salt sources when they are deficient in salt. Uh, and that's a basis of what we use for many of our uh, uh, mineral feeding programs where, where we're providing that mineral on a free choice basis. Uh, so we add the salt to it and they seek that salt out. Uh, the other is phosphorus and, and you will see uh, uh, in severe situations, uh, uh, pica conditions for example, where it's a severe deficiency of phosphorus, uh, they will actually chew bones if, you know, if they were in the vicinity of of a skeleton, for example, uh, which they may may very well be if it's a severe phosphorus deficiency. Uh, but they will, you know, they will seek out phosphorus if they can do that. But can uh, a beef cow uh, identify that it's copper deficient and then go out and seek out a specific copper source? Uh, no, I do not uh, have any proof that they can do that. Okay. Next question is. Um, what are chelated minerals, and are they better? Okay, um, the, many of the minerals that we we would purchase uh, from uh, uh, most most feed minerals that are out there, put it this way, are going to be of the uh, inorganic classification. So, uh, for example. Uh, copper could be supplied in that mineral as copper sulfate or copper chloride or copper oxide. Uh, so they're, a, they're an inorganic source of copper. Same thing with zinc, uh, zinc oxide, zinc, zinc sulfate, for example. Um, inorganic sources of mineral that, uh, as I've talked about, uh, are relatively poorly absorbed. Okay, so uh, and if, if we look, for example, at copper oxide, uh, you know, that's something that I would always look at a mineral tag for, uh, and I would shy away from any mineral that's got copper oxide as a copper source, uh, simply because it's very poorly absorbed. Uh, I would much prefer having copper sulfate as a source of mineral. Um, so those are inorganic sources of mineral that are relatively poorly absorbed. Uh, and if we're dealing with a situation, much like I showed in one of my last slides, where we've got a very antagonistic situation with sulfates in the water, molybdenum in the feed that's going to tie up copper, uh, perhaps very high iron sources in our water that's going to tie up copper or zinc. Uh, I might want to strategically supplement a mineral that is going to be uh, better absorbed. And that's where these chelated minerals come into play. Chelated minerals are those that um, uh, are uh, uh, in in the processing of them. They're actually complex to a protein, uh, for example, copper protonate, or to an amino acid such as lysine or methionine, and they are much better absorbed in the small intestine than these inorganic minerals. So if we've got a situation where we have this antagonistic situation uh, for copper absorption. Perhaps we've got calves under stress. Perhaps we've got an ET program where we really want to generate a high uh, success in terms of oocyte recovery and fertilization. Uh, it might pay producers to start to think about feeding chelated minerals to boost absorption just to ensure that those animals under stress or under that antagonistic situation will get the copper absorbed that they require. 
but that tends to come as a bit of a price. So they are, uh, uh, you know, significantly higher than the inorganics in terms of uh, uh, cost, and you really want to be strategic in their feeding. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, okay, next one's for you, Reynold. How does the BCRC decide which research to fund? Oh, I think... Thanks. The... Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Thanks again. The uh, the way the way the BCRC operates that's a good question actually because while it's the BCR the, the the producers that sit on BCRC that make the funding decisions are experts at what they do and they're really progressive producers which is why they're attracted to research. They often don't have you know the the the, the time to keep right current with what the prevailing state of science is and so the what the the council does instead is when a research proposal comes to them it it they they screen it in a couple of ways the first way that that a research proposal gets screened is they'll they'll screen it against our we have a national beef research strategy that that lays out not only what our priority research areas are, like food safety and beef quality and forage productivity and environment and animal health and welfare and feed efficiency, that sort of thing, but within those, it lays out really specific target outcomes. So, so not just forage as a priority, but you know, a 10% improvement in forage yield is what we're trying to achieve. So, so the first thing we do is when we're looking for research proposals, we'll make it really, really clear about these are the specific types of proposals we're looking for. And then when these proposals come in, that's the first thing they get weighed against is how well are they aligned with what we're looking for. And then the second thing they do is if these projects appear to be aligned with, with what they're interested in funding is, is a staff will go and identify some researchers who are really, really deeply involved in that area and send those proposals to them um, confidentially. And so we'll have these independent experts look at them and, and look at these projects and say, well, is this really new research for one thing? Um, or are they just kind of retilling old ground? Um, secondly, is it um, a well-designed project, and and is it going to answer the the question that 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 you really want answered? So they'll they'll send their scientific review back to us, and we'll look at all these proposals and all these reviews, and and assess them and present them all to the council and say, okay, here's the ones that are good science, and here's the ones that are bad science. So really, don't recommend funding these. Here's the good ones, and and often all, all every time there are more good proposals there than there are dollars to spend. And so, what the council then does is they look at these proposals and they say, okay, well, given that we've got all these good scientific proposals, which are the ones that are most likely to give the biggest benefit to the most producers in Canada? So that's kind of how the process works, and. Uh, how often we do that depends uh, largely on how much m money we've got at hand. Um, traditionally, it was every year. Currently, it's every second or, th or third year, just because we're uh, the way the beef cluster operates. Does that answer the question? Good, thank you. Um, okay, so a few more questions for John. A uh, couple of questions asking whether it's possible to feed too much mineral. So would that hinder cattle health or would it cause toxicity? Uh, no, that, that certainly is a great question and um, there, there very, very much is the concept of uh, mineral toxicities. Um, again, it can uh, occur with a lot of the, the trace minerals. Uh, but as well as with the, the macro minerals. So I, for example, mentioned the concept of uh, too much potassium, uh, and uh, that can lead to issues with uh, uh, 
grass staggers or, or winter tetany in uh, uh, in cows just prior to calving due to uh, uh, magnesium tie-up. Uh, it could also lead to milk fever situations uh, because of calcium, uh, tying up calcium as well. Uh, we can get into issues with copper. So uh, where we, we're worried about copper and we're worried about the antagonistic uh, effects of uh, uh, some of these other minerals on copper, if we have too much copper being supplied to the animal, uh, you can get into situations of copper tox toxicity. So uh, I think it's anywhere from, uh, you know, I think the maximum copper tolerance is, is about 100 parts per million. Um, so it's not that much higher than, you know, it's 10 times higher than the requirement, right? So uh, you, you do have to be, uh, uh, recognize that. Selenium is another one uh, where, um, you know, very low levels are required. But we could get into issues where, uh, for example, there, there are plants that will accumulate selenium. And uh, if we happen to be supplying selenium in a salt block, for example, or, or in a mineral block, for example, uh, we might be uh, injecting those animals with selenium. Uh, there could be several sources where the selenium will start to accumulate. And uh, the difference between the selenium requirement and selenium toxicity is very narrow. So you, you have to be aware of the fact that you can get into situations of toxicity uh, and not overfeed these minerals. Great. Next question is, I'm feeding mineral mix that has salt in it. Will the salt decrease the shelf life of the mineral or damage it if it sits for a while? Uh, the salt, not per se. The issue, uh, uh, if it's sitting for a long while, uh, and again, it would vary with the mineral formulation of, of the companies, but what I would be concerned about would be the uh, longevity of the vitamins in that mineral, uh, not specifically the the uh, uh, minerals themselves. So the the uh, first issues would be with the stability of vitamin A uh, in that mineral if that is the vitamin A source. Okay. Next question: Would the inclusion of clover or other types of forages require different mineral mixes? Uh, yes. It, kind of gets back to um, at the beginning of the presentation when I was talking about different forages where we can talk about, you know, in general, uh, because of the characteristics of, of this type of forage, uh, we, we will look to this type of, uh, of a calcium and phosphorus mineral. And so clover being uh, a legume is uh, going to be relatively high in calcium uh, and um, uh, relatively low in phosphorus. So in that type of situation, we would be very much like uh, alfalfa, alfalfa grass uh, type situations. We'd be looking at a mineral that is going to supply phosphorus, and we're not going to be overly concerned with phosphorus or with calcium. Okay, next question is, how stable is the vitamin A in mineral mixes? Does exposure to sunlight or water degrade vitamin A? Again, that's very much... Uh, along the lines uh, of uh, the question two questions ago, um, if, if we're storing those minerals for, for uh, a significant period of time, uh, it will vary uh, depending upon uh, the formulations by the company, uh, but the, the vitamin A would be the, uh, probably the, the first um, uh, uh, nutrient in that mineral that, that I would be concerned about in terms of stability. Uh, it's going to be the least stable, uh, the vitamin A, D, and E uh, relative to the minerals themselves. Okay, a few more questions and then we're going to move on. Um, how do I know the availability of the minerals? Is there any, uh, are there any types of mineral that are not 100% available? Yes, that's that's pretty easy question. Virtually all of them are not 100% available. There, uh, there's tremendous variability in um, the uh, types of uh, the inorganic uh, minerals in terms of their availability. Uh, so, for example, and again, it's a little bit along the lines of 
of uh, a question earlier. Uh, when you look at sources of copper, inorganic uh, sources of copper, uh, if we look at copper oxide, um, it, it's, it's very, very poorly available, probably less than 15% available. Uh, if we look at zinc oxide, it's relatively available. Okay? So zinc oxide is, is uh, relatively available, copper oxide is not. So if, you, if you're going to look uh, for, for copper sources, uh, my, my suggestion would be that you look to copper sulfides, sulfates uh, and uh, uh, copper carbonate, for example. Okay. Um, in regards to supplying mineral, how many access points do you recommend per 20 or 50 animals? By access points, I, are they referring to, I, I assume they're referring to mineral feeders? Probably. Yeah. So, uh, well, I think that's, um, you know, certainly availability is uh, 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 going to be important. Uh, we want to make sure those cows can get to that mineral feeder uh, and, and get uh, uh, access to it, uh, you know, at least every second day. Uh, so I would think that if you are looking at uh, probably a maximum of uh, uh, 20 to 30 cows per mineral feeder. Uh, you know, it's going to vary a little bit on the size of the, of the feeder, uh, but you want to have enough of those feeders that are spread out so that uh, there's going to be access to the cows. So I think that's a, a pretty realistic number, 20 to 30. If you're looking at some of these other issues, whether it's tubs or blocks, uh, you know, that that tag is going to uh, give you recommendations to uh, uh, what the company would uh, uh, recommend in terms of number of uh, uh, tubs or, or blocks per, per number of cows per block. Okay, I'm going to ask three more questions. I know that there's more sitting there, but just considering the time, um, I'm going to ask three more and then we'll move on. So next one would be, uh, molasses lick tubs are expensive, but claim to deliver minerals more effectively. Can you comment on mineral lick tubs versus loose mineral programs? Uh, certainly when you look at, at, at these um, uh, these programs, uh, the, the molasses tubs, you know, you can, uh, you could, you, they're, they're a nice product. Um, they, uh, depending upon uh, the the process that's uh, uh, used to, to design them. They can be uh, very weatherproof, uh, uh, good stability to them. Uh, they can certainly have the appropriate formulations in them in terms of uh, uh, the uh, uh, macro minerals, trace minerals, the vitamins. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're, a, they're a very nice method of providing uh, minerals to the cow herd in a very palatable form. Um, it's much like many, you know, many different uh, products that are out there uh, for that uh, convenience and for that um, uh, ease of feeding and for the, the palatability. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more expensive than what we see with a loose mineral feeding program. Uh, they might guarantee, uh, not guarantee, but they might allow for better uh, consumption of that mineral. And so I guess if, if, if I was looking at using them, I guess I would want to, uh, to really to be able to justify that I'm going to go to this additional expense to uh, solve a problem that I have, to solve a problem that a loose mineral feeding program uh, is not solving for me. So if I can find the appropriate uh, loose mineral feeding program or self-feeding program uh, that uh, these cows, uh, that I can keep them on a year-round basis, that I can target their needs as it changes throughout the year, uh, and I can, um, uh, you know, get the level of performance that I want out of the herd, uh, I'm going to be happy with that, and I'm not necessarily going to move to the expense of uh, going to some of these other programs. So they, they, again, they work, they're very good programs, but you do pay uh, a little bit more for them. Okay. 
okay, this question, uh, Reynolds, I'm going to direct to you to, to see what you think here. Can taking blood samples from animals be an effective way to get a general idea of your herd's mineral levels? So taking blood samples as opposed to taking forage and water samples throughout the year since conditions and mineral levels are constantly changing. Well, I'll take a, I'll take a shot at it because you asked me to, but I'll, I will call John in it, or call John in for his opinion on it as well. The, uh, you could. Um, I suspect that taking, you know, a water sample or a forage sample would be an awful lot easier for one thing, and rather than sampling a whole bunch of cows and going through whole, all that effort, I would, I would rather collect a representative sample of, of the forage or water on a periodic basis. Um, the other thing that I would be a little bit concerned about, and I think it might vary from mineral to mineral, is that although the, the levels of the mineral in the blood will tell you what its status is right now, it doesn't necessarily reflect the body stores. And so, you know, some of these minerals, like John said, are going to be stored in other parts of the body, whether it's the liver or the uh, the uh, bones and what have you. And and just because it's uh, you know levels in the blood are adequate now doesn't mean that they're necessarily not going to run out shortly. Um, so I don't know. I wouldn't. Uh, I would not be inclined towards blood sampling instead of feed sampling. But John, could you clarify anything? Uh, yeah, you're, you're exactly. You're exactly right, Reynolds. Uh, um, I, I hate to say that you're exactly right, honestly. <laughs> but uh, uh, if you look, for example, at copper, uh, if you if you look at serum copper levels, uh, they're only going to be of value to you if the animal is showing a deficiency in terms of serum copper. That's telling you the liver is deficient, right? So the the liver is supplying uh, the blood with the copper levels. And uh, if you've got normal uh, uh, serum copper levels, all that's telling you is that there is still copper coming from the, the liver to keep them normal. It's not telling you that the liver is being depleted. So uh, it's only a diagnostic tool, in my opinion, and you're much better off, much less hassle. Get your forage tested. Get your water tested. Mm. Okay, and then last question for tonight. Uh, John, can you please expand on how to mitigate instances of winter tetany? Uh, yes, so that's, it's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, 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 situation that uh, uh, we saw crop up probably 10 years ago or when I first saw it. But uh, tetany is really... Uh, uh, the winter tetany is really uh, a function of even though there is normal magnesium levels, because there is high levels of potassium uh, in uh, the forage that we get what's called the tetany ratio thrown out of whack. And we can actually uh, analyze the forages for this tetany ratio and we can uh, start to look to see whether uh, it is greater or less than a critical factor. And uh, if we do that, uh, we can really get a diagnostic tool that will tell us uh, that because of this high potassium in our forages, we either have to change the mix of forages uh, to reduce the potassium load uh, and therefore uh, reduce the incidence of uh, uh, of this magnesium deficiency that's induced. So it's really a, a secondary deficiency that is caused by high potassium. Uh, where we saw it, uh, for example, 10 years ago was uh, in green feed, uh, grown under a growth situation. It was in 2002, for example, and the, there was a lot of green feed that was being grown in a part of the province here uh, that was being grown for forage and it was under a drought situation, and the land had been uh, heavily uh, uh, fertilized with manure, which is high in potassium. So that, that uh, green feed, as it was growing, was sucking up a lot of this potassium, and we were dealing with 2 3% and higher levels of potassium in the forage, which really threw this ratio out of, out of whack and induced uh, this winter tetany. 
or symptoms of winter tick. Great, thank you. Um, so I think we'll wrap up the questions now, just um, looking at the time here. So sorry to the folks who I know have sent in some questions that we didn't cover. Um, if you do have burning questions, feel free to email those in and we'll do our best to get an answer for you. Or of course, um, you can talk to your veterinarian, your herd nutritionist, or the regional uh, extension specialist that you've got, uh, most likely through your provincial ministry of agriculture. So some more resources that uh, you can talk to about mineral supplementation. So just a couple more important things I wanted to let you know about before we go. Um, to get more information on things like new research results and science-based production advice from the VCRC, including to find out about our future webinars, be sure to sign up to our email list. So just go to our website, which is www.bfreesearch.ca, and click on that subscribe button. And if you're on Twitter or Facebook or have a YouTube account, you can connect with us there as well. Um, and tonight we've been tweeting with the hashtag BeefWebinar. Uh, you'll see us on Twitter after we end the webinar here as well. And I also encourage you to visit the Canadian Cattlemen's Association website at cattle.ca, and there you can sign up for their newsletter called Action News. So after the webinar, you'll be asked to complete a short survey that will ask you um, what you thought of tonight's webinar and what you're most interested for future webinar topics. We do need your feedback in order to do the best job that we can to deliver information that's useful and meaningful to you and helps you make informed decisions on what's best for your operation. So please do complete that survey and don't ever hesitate to contact us at the Beef Cattle Research Council with any comments or questions at any time. So again, you'll receive an email from me in a couple of days with a link to watch the recording, uh, as well as some additional information on mineral supplementation. Uh, and on behalf of everyone who joined in tonight and those who are watching the recording, thank you, Reynolds and Dr. McKinnon, for volunteering your time and expertise for this webinar tonight. Well, so you. that's it. Thank you. So thanks, everyone, for your interest. And we hope to see you out at producer meetings or conferences and back here sometime on another webinar. So good night.